Hey, we have some big news for some of you. Uh, a lot of you are into Venmo. I personally don't use Venmo yet, but we've had people ask, can you get Venmo? Because it's real easy to use. I think there's a little less fees involved than, than PayPal, but we don't mind either one. However, it's convenient for you to give, go ahead and get on our Facebook page. Uh, we have this, I've been sending it out in emails, or search Hope and Passion Ministries on Venmo, and you will be able to scan and you will be able to give. It's very easy, it's very direct, so if you're familiar with Venmo, please go ahead and know that you can use that. Otherwise, always know that you can contact us at hopeandpassion.org to continue to allow us to do what we do. Of course, this is something that I'm giving my life's work to. It is way above and beyond a full-time job and all the expenses that we have related to our broadcasting. So hopeandpassion.org is where you can give if the Lord puts it on your heart to be a partner with us. And you can also give at Hope and Passion Ministries in Irwin, Pennsylvania. Now, before I pray over the word that we are going to dig into here, I want to share with you guys... Uh, the technical department and I had a time of prayer before I came on, and I really needed it. I wanted to share with you, I thank all of you for your consistent prayers for me, spiritually, physically, emotionally. I really thank you for that. I love every opportunity I have to share God's word. And today, this afternoon, I had the opportunity to share God's word in a setting that I don't usually share it, in a setting where I, I'm many, many, the vast majority of the people there were not born again believers. It was with a lot of business people and uh, leadership people. And I was asked to go and to share about Hope and Passion Ministries and what I'm doing on TikTok. Uh, I didn't know a soul, you know, I, I didn't know anybody. I walked into the situation and I knew that it was going to be interesting to say the least because if you know me you know that I cannot and I will not hold back I knew that I was there to share Jesus Christ that I was not going to miss that opportunity and I didn't care who looked at me like I had three heads and I got up and I gave my testimony and I shared the gospel of Jesus Christ no less than five times in the middle of my presentation of what I do in the community of Irwin okay and it was incredible. I could see some people just shock. I could tell that some people had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a straightforward way. On the other hand, I could see on the faces of some that there was a clear resistance and block to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but I've got to tell you something. It was one of those days where I've hardly ever felt the presence of the Holy Spirit with me so strongly. There was Jesus, right? Went into a situation where I knew no one. I had no idea how the meetings were run. Um, all I knew was God told me, you get up there, no matter what happens, you do exactly what you had planned to do. And my friends, that's what I did. And so I praise God that the gospel was shared. It was draining. My blood sugar right before I came on this evening was up to almost 400. So... I'm a little bit, uh, just a little bit off tonight, but I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is going to work in an incredible way, as he always does. Jesus is always with us. All right. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would. I'm not going to read, again, because of all the names and how long it would take to get through it. We'll get to the text. But if you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis chapter 14. We are going to begin right at verse 5. So Genesis chapter 14, verse 5. Thank you for the thumbs up. Continue your prayers for me. I was looking forward to this evening. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine who couldn't come on the live stream tonight texted me ahead of time and told me she wouldn't be here, but she was praying for me. And I said, you'll never know what those prayers mean. And she said, let the Genesis Bible study people lift you up. It's a lot. <laughs> I'll tell you what. It is a lot different to preach to a group such as all of you than it was today to preach to the group that I did preach to, but it all is necessary. Hallelujah. Okay, so Genesis chapter 14, we're going to start at verse 5 in just a moment, so I'm going to ask you to pray with me. 
This is what matters. It's not what Shelley Prindle has to say. It's what the Holy Spirit has to say as he illuminates the word of God. Just so you all remember, originally, through the original writers of scripture, God inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired God breathed out his word through those writers. The inspiration part has been done. But when we open up our Bibles, we are depending on the same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who worked through and blew God's word through Moses when he wrote Genesis is the same Holy Spirit who is on this broadcast tonight, who is working over the internet who will illuminate, all right? The inspiration stage is done, but the illumination of God's word is still happening. He will light it up for us. So we come before you, God, in Jesus' name, and we ask you to light up your word in our souls, to invigorate us in our faith. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name, and I thank you for the faithfulness of your Holy Spirit, who I sensed was right beside me all day long. The Holy Spirit, who I know is with us right now, I thank you for his presence. I pray over every person that is watching this broadcast, whether live or in the recording. We pray right now in Jesus' name for the power of your Holy Spirit to move. I pray for people to be saved I pray for Christians to be set on fire for Jesus. I pray for a wisdom and understanding of your word to come in a way that it has never come before. I'm believing for changed lives. I'm believing, Lord Jesus, that you're calling people into their specific ministry and witness for you. And we're just expecting great things because of Jesus Christ, because of our sovereign God who has it all under control from beginning to end. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking this too, and I don't wanna to fail to, to say it because I know God had put it on my heart. You know, I sat out on the porch and was looking over the text of scripture for tonight. And I thought, I mean, maybe you thought Genesis 14 was boring, but last week you found out it's not, right? But you know, some of these texts and some of these narratives we may look at and say, this is more difficult to plow through than other areas of the Bible. But I want to encourage you to remember something. It is in the everyday plowing through all of the counsel of the word of God that you grow in the Lord. You can't just take out a daily devotional and just pull a scripture here and there once or twice a day. You can't say, well, I'm going to go through the Bible and read the parts that I deem exciting. I'm testifying to this over a lifetime of personal study. You have to plow through and push through the whole counsel of the word of God. And even the parts that don't feel exciting to you, the word of God never returns void. So God is doing something through every part of it. It can be discouraging when I realize that Christians, you know, they'll tune into certain broadcasts and not others because this excites them and this doesn't, that is an unhealthy approach to the word of God. We need to take in the whole counsel of the word. So I just, you know, kudos to all of you who are going through Genesis with us verse by verse. It is very important. You don't even realize how important, but I think many of you are getting to see that you can only connect scripture to scripture if you know the scripture, unbroken as it is, amen? Okay, so that is a thought that we're gonna have in mind as we begin to dig in here at uh, Genesis chapter 15, or chapter 14 and verse five. Before we get to the text, let's refresh our memories from where we were. I know last week was exciting, and we had learned that the first recorded war in scripture here in Genesis 14 involved four kings from the east. Do you remember that? These four kings were north and east of the Euphrates River, right? And we talked about the importance of the Mesopotamian Valley, how the Garden of Eden was there, the Tower of Babel was there, um, the flood originated there. We talked about how God's people were taken captive by the Babylonians. 
Uh, we, we talked about the second coming of the Lord and how the Battle of Armageddon will be fought over there in that area in the Middle East. So it was just interesting because the Euphrates River, geographically speaking, as that Lebanese Christian testified to, there are demonic forces being bound and held at this river right now, gearing up for the time of the tribulation. So what we learned was that four kings from the east were going to come and they were going to attack kings of the plain area uh, where Abram was. And I had another map that was a close-up of the Euphrates River with the modern-day locations so that you can know when we're talking about this in Genesis 14, we are talking about the areas that today are Iraq, Syria, Turkey, uh, and, and moving over to Russia even, right? These are the areas that we're talking about from Genesis 14. And it's really cool to understand that. Uh, I've had so many people say, including TikTokers, you know, people who watch the TikToks, they say they really appreciate the fact that I am bringing the Bible to modern events, right? And that is critical to understand. And so when we're talking about the kings of the plain, you know, we have these kings from the east, but the five kings that they came against were all from this area here right below the Dead Sea. So kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. <clears throat> Genesis 14, 5 and 6. Here we go with the text. So in the 14th year, Keterleomer and the kings who were with him now, Keterleomer was one of the kings from the east, from the Euphrates River. Keterleomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Carnium, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shever, Kiriathium, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is, Kadesh and defeated all the country of the Amicalites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hezazon Tamar. Now I know that doesn't mean much to us, but here's what's happening. Keterleomer and the other three kings, in their mad fury against these kings of the plain, came down and destroyed everything in their path getting to the five kings. Now if you go back and remember... The reason Keterleomer and the other three are attacking the kings of the plain is these five kings from around the Dead Sea were, in modern day terms, we could say they were vassal states. They were paying, having to pay tribute to Keterleomer and his gang. And they felt like they wanted to break off their chains and they rose up in rebellion. And so Keterleomer and his three kings, they come down and they are furious. And they attack and they declare war on all the area as they come down through. Henry Morris said this, the result of this ill-considered rebellion. Now the rebellion again was the kings of the plain, the five kings from right around the Dead Sea who were trying to throw off um, the lordship, if you will, of Keterleomer. They didn't want to pay tribute anymore. They didn't want to be under his thumb anymore. But the result of that ill-considered rebellion was that it precipitated Keterleomer's destructive invasion. Apparently, he not only directed his bitterness against the Jordanian cities, but against all the others in the region. You know, when I read that, when I think about that, isn't that what happens in anger? You know, if we let our anger or our rebellion get out of control... We're not only directing it towards the person we're angry at, but it can have all kinds of effects as we storm through something and as we do whatever we feel like doing. So it's an interesting picture to have in your mind. Now I'm going to go back to Dr. Nelson Gluick, who is a leading Palestinian archaeologist of modern times, and his comment on this as a professional. He said this comparatively minor insurrection was thereupon utilized as a pretext to settle old scores and to raid and ravage with unleashed 
ferocity for as much booty as could possibly be won. A punitive expedition developed into an orgy of annihilation. And you think about that, it's what I just said before. Anger can very easily get out of control. And it did for this alliance of kings. They were coming to punish for a certain thing, and it just led into this just massive annihilation. Okay? For hundreds of years thereafter, says the archaeologist, the entire area was like an abandoned cemetery, hideously unkempt, with all its monuments shattered and strewn in pieces on the ground. Now, this is coming from a secular archaeologist telling us what the results of this war were as the kings from the east came down. It's, it's incredible, and it's real history. Now, I like what Matthew Henry says here. He says, pride, covetousness, and ambition are the lusts from which wars and fightings come. To these insatiable idols, the blood of thousands has been sacrificed. Amen? When people get in power, I don't care what kind of power it is, political power, power in the corporation, power over uh, people in the home. I mean, when people who are in positions of leadership become filled with their own pride, become covetous of what they don't yet have, want to climb the ladder, and just that's their only goal is to be above everybody else. When that gets skewed and perverted, terrible things happen. And it's not just, you know, in physical wars that this takes place. But I mean, in our drive to climb the corporate ladder, in our drive to be uh, in charge or over everyone else out of pride or selfish ambition, we're going down a road that is exactly opposite of what God would have for us. How many of you know that Jesus said, he that would be greatest among you shall be your what? Your servant. That even a leader should have an attitude of servanthood. And Keterleomer stands as an example as what happens when we let pride take over and ambition. Henry Morris said this, the invasion of the northeastern kings first crushed all the tribes north, east, and then west of the Salt Sea. Remember, Salt Sea is the Dead Sea before it reached the five cities on the southern shores against which the invasion had been mounted in the first place. So again, they are going to attack everything northeast and west of the Dead Sea before getting to the kings that are at the heart of the matter. And here's a map for you to see this. Um, this is the Mediterranean Sea here, and this is a map that shows us in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is where it's set. So here's the Salt Sea, which today we call the Dead Sea. And what is being told to us here is these kings came down and they... They took everyone out west, east, and north of this area before they came down to this right here where we have Zoar, Gomorrah, Sodom, and all the area where these kings were that they were after in the first place. So you can see uh, all that space that was devastated, all that land. All right, Henry Morris again. The purpose of these preliminary battles was no doubt to eliminate the possibility of an attack from the rear while they were occupied with the five kings. In other words, they knew what their focus was, but they probably also didn't want to be attacked from behind as they're coming down on those kings. Genesis 14 now, verses 8 and 9. So here <clears throat> we see the list of kings again. Now, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out. All right, so those are the kings of the plain, right below the Dead Sea. And they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with the five, with the four kings from the east. So you have the five kings of the plain rebelling because they are angry at having to pay tribute, of having to be under the thumb of Keterleomer, and they go to battle with 
these four kings. So I have a red line drawn there so that you can see the difference. You have five kings against only four. The four are the ones who came down in a rage to attack these vassal states, if you will. Now, the Valley of Siddim, now this is really interesting. This gets interesting, okay? So God gives us this detail. He tells us that the Valley of Siddim, where they met for war, was full of bitumen pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest ran to the hill country. Now, yes, we are talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are soon going to be judged in a much greater way than this. But these kings of Sodom and Gomorrah began to run, and the Bible tells us they fell into these asphalt or bitumen pits, and some kept running to the hill country. So it deserves a little bit of discussion here to talk about what actually happened. First of all, Adam Clark, the Bible commentator, tells us that these pits were places where asphalt or bitumen sprang out of the ground. This substance abounded in that country, in that place there in the Middle East. And so these were where springs of asphalt would be coming out of the ground. Now, what we read in the English Standard Version is that some of these kings and their army men fell into them. John Gill, love him as a Bible commentator, here's what he had to say about that. The slime pits or fountains of bitumen into which they precipitately fell and many perished, or of their own accord they threw themselves into them for their own safety, as some scholars think. Okay, so did they fall accidentally? Or did they fall into them as a matter of self-preservation? John Gill is bringing up that question. John Calvin said this, some expound that the men of that region fell into pits, but this is not probable since they were by no means ignorant of these neighboring places. In other words, these kings knew that the pits were there, so did they accidentally fall into them? It's kind of like when you're driving your car down the road in western Pennsylvania. You get to know where all the potholes are, right? You know they're there, and so you avoid them. So that's the point that he's bringing up. Such an event would rather have happened to foreigners if foreigners were on the run. So he goes on to say, others say they went down into them for the sake of preserving their lives. In other words, they were hiding in the pits. I, John Calvin says, however, understand them to have exchanged one kind of death for another kind of death as is common in the moment of desperation, as if Moses, when he was writing this, said that the swords of the enemy were so formidable to these kings that without hesitation, they threw themselves headlong into the pits. For he immediately adds that they who escaped fled to the hills. They fell, not so much deceived through ignorance of the place, as disheartened by fear. And that's interesting. You know, I don't know a lot about war and methods of war, but I, I've seen movies, I don't know if this is true or not, where, you know, different people are given poisons or ways to do away with themselves if they were to be taken prisoner of war, if they were to be attacked in a certain way. So this is this definitely not out of the question? Now, the third John, okay, now we have another John talking about this. And John Gill, um, we have John Calvin and now John Phillips said this. There seems to be a poetic justice in it all. Sodom and Gomorrah were vile and filthy beyond words. Their sin was a stench in the nostrils of God. It was fitting that their king should be hauled off to captivity, all besmirched and be daubed with slime. I thought that was an interesting comment too, that some of them fell into the pits and some of them fled to the country. And as we know, we're gonna get into how God personally judged Sodom and Gomorrah. John Phillips said, filthy they were within, 
filthy they were without. A spectacle to men and angels, mute evidence that God is not mocked. I want to tell you something. It is very important for Christians to remember that God is not mocked. Uh, we can be mocked, right? But we are hidden with Christ in God. And I always try to remember that. I want to encourage some of you right now. You know, God will not be mocked. Judgment will come. People who have rejected God will come to be seen for what they are. And we who have hidden ourselves in Christ will come to be seen for who we are. Amen? God cannot be mocked. In my ministry on TikTok, you know, I've told you, and, and just standing in front of a group of people today, there are times when you, you can be outright ridiculed, made fun of, cursed out for what you say about Jesus Christ. There are times when people will politely look at you like you have three heads, or they can't even look at you because they think so little of you. And people can say horrible things about Jesus Christ, horrible things about God. But we must remember that they will not get away with those things. And that vengeance is not ours to take. Amen? Because Colossians chapter 3 tells us that when Jesus finally appears in his glory, my friends, that is when the Bible promises in Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4, Please read that, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. The Bible then promises that when Jesus finally appears in his glory, we will appear in his glory. We will be known for who we truly are. Isn't that beautiful? Because when Jesus came to earth the first time, he did not come in his glory. He came in his humility, withholding his glory. He came and he was mocked. And he wasn't understood. And he wasn't known for who he was. But the Bible promises that when he returns a second time, he will be known. In the same way, you are not known for who you truly are. Your glory is so awesome in Christ. But just as Jesus was never fully understood in this broken world, you are not going to be. And I got to tell you, when I stood in front of those people today, very successful people... And I told the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what I was thinking of. I'm in Christ. You can take what I say or you can leave what I say. But someday, whether you come to Jesus or you stay in rebellion against him, someday you will know that Jesus is the only Savior and Lord. And you will know that when I stood before you, I was telling you the truth. Amen? That is a beautiful, beautiful promise. I, I wish I could remember the reference, but there's a verse in um, Isaiah. It's either Isaiah 25 or 26, where God tells us that at the return of Jesus, the Lord will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. He will remove the reproach of his people. We are mocked and reproached now, but we won't be in the end. Okay, so that is a promise. So when I think of what John Phillips said, it is appropriate that these people who stand in rebellion against God, what they are on the inside will someday be seen to all, right? We can hide our sin in darkness now. We can feel comfortable with others as we rebel in our sin now, but there's coming a day when all that's going to be uncovered. And uh, okay, Bria's told me it's Isaiah 25 8 thank you very much isaiah 25 8 hold on to that promise god will one day remove the reproach of his people from all the earth so you keep standing strong so verses 11 and 12 the enemy took now watch this this is critical the enemy took all the possessions of sodom and gomorrah and all their provisions and they went their way now before uh you would even read the next sentence you remember who's in sodom right Abram's nephew Lot, he chose that territory. So they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and they went their way. There it is. Lot officially becomes a prisoner of war. And yes, it's true that one of the reasons he was prisoner of war 
is he chose the wrong territory. How many of you remember studying this back a few sessions back, right? When Abram, who didn't have to give Lot anything, gave him first choice. And the Bible was very clear that Lot lifted up his physical eyes. He, he wasn't thinking spiritually about it. He wasn't thinking generously about it. But he, in his pride, rather than in his humility, lifted up his eyes, the lust of his eyes, said, that's the area I want. That has the riches and the stuff that I want. And he chose the area towards Sodom. So he ends up a prisoner of war. And... I hadn't thought about this when I was preparing the message, but the Holy Spirit's prompting my heart right now. Christians can become prisoners of war. You can temporarily become a POW because of your ungodly choices, because of your sin. Now that's not to say that God is not going to rescue you out because Lot gets rescued here. Because ultimately Lot was a righteous man. He, he was a believer in God, as we're told in the New Testament. But he was a much more carnal Christian, if you will, than his uncle Abram. But I want to tell you, be very careful. You know, just because we have the grace of God doesn't mean we abuse the grace of God. Amen? Just because Paul said this. You know, Paul, Paul says this all throughout his letters. Just because you have the freedom... To make the choice you want to make as a Christian, if you choose the world, if you choose materialism, if you choose to hang with the ungodly, if you choose all those things as a Christian, you have the freedom to do it. But God cannot protect you from the consequences of behavior that is outside his will. Amen? He's going to have to rescue you out of it. So... Lot becomes a prisoner of war. God has not forgotten him. But Lot wouldn't have had to have gone through all this, would he? If this had not been the case. If he had not followed the lust of his eyes. I'll never forget. I think it was John Phillips when we were doing those sessions who, um, you, you know, he talked about Lot, his house was a tent at that time that he probably, you know, kept looking out the door and he kept seeing the area that he wanted. And when the chance came for him to go, then he went. And I shared with you that evening, and I remember it, I'm going to share it again. What your mind is on, what you focus on, that's your idol, that's what you worship, and you run towards it. If you start to think about certain things and sins, you will end up there. If you make your focus Jesus Christ and his word, and you keep that as your aim, you will end up there. Amen? So Lot becomes a prisoner of war, along with all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, they took Lot. <clears throat> Keterleomer's armies then gathered up all the possessions of the vanquished cities, including the women and children and servants, as well as many captured soldiers. And they headed back north again. They also took Lot, who was dwelling in Sodom at the time. Henry Morris, in spite of his carnality, now, just to pause, so some of you may not be familiar with how the Bible speaks of this. Carnal means fleshly, okay? So when we talk about Jesus being the incarnate son of God, we mean he is in the flesh God, all right? Because he came and he put on flesh, now, we as Christians are not supposed to live by the power of our flesh because we're saved here in this world, but we're still living in unredeemed bodies. And the Bible says that uh, there is going to be a war between our redeemed spirit that's been made new in Christ and our flesh. There's going to be a war between the two. So what Henry Morris is saying is Lot was pretty carnal. And what, what you would translate that to mean is Lot was a Christian who chose to live by his fleshly desires rather than by God's perfect will. Now, despite the fact that he was carnal, he was a righteous man. We're told that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. Maybe we should just turn there and look at that for a minute in context. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8.
well, this is interesting. This is talking, you know, related to the verse that we mentioned last week about the uh, fallen angels or the demons who are bound at the Euphrates River. Because the context of this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, talks about God not sparing the angels when they sin. But he cast them into Tartarus, the abyss, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Then, verse 5, if God did not spare the ancient world, in other words, he flooded the whole world, but he preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, along with seven others, when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. If, verse 6, by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of, of what is going to happen to the ungodly, verse 7, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, 4, verse 8, as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard finishes out the thought, the thought by saying, then God knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So the flow of context is, if when God brings judgment, he knows how to deliver the righteous, and then it focuses in on the fact that Lot was a believer. He was a righteous man, Second Peter 2.8 says. Okay, keep that in mind because it's important to understand in this whole flow of thought. So in spite of his carnality, Lot was a righteous man as well as nephew of Abram who had received God's call. So God would not allow Lot to be carried off by Keterleomer. God was going to rescue Lot. And it, that whole narrative there where it talks about, you know, Noah being rescued from the rest of the ungodly with his family and Lot being rescued out of Sodom and Gomorrah because he was righteous. What does that put you in mind of? I hope some of you are fast forwarding to an event that's going to soon take place on the earth, right? God knows how to rescue the righteous when he's going to punish the ungodly. We will not be here for the tribulation. Amen? God put Noah up in an ark. And Noah floated above the waters of judgment while judgment came to the ungodly. And then God let Noah come back down to the earth, the new earth. No, it was brand new, but had just been flooded, just been cleansed to some degree. God's going to do the same thing for us Christians. When the flood of the tribulation judgment comes upon the earth, we will be lifted up to heaven, amen, with Jesus for all those seven years. And at the end of it, we're going to come back down and rest on not a cleansed earth, but a brand new earth. Isn't that beautiful? So you can see that picture in that text. Oh, and I had this scripture up here and I didn't even realize, but let's look particularly at this one again. As that righteous man lived among them day after day, the people of Sodom, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. It was no doubt a source of torment to Lot to be surrounded in such a way. And I, I got to tell you, you know, I was saying to Bria before we went on the air, I said, you know what? Hands down, all right, there is no comparison between my love for being with the people of God, being with Christians who want more of the Lord. We're not perfect, but we want more of the Lord. Hands down, no different. There's the hugest difference between that and having to be surrounded by the unsaved and the ungodly and all the things that they do and that they say, and even if it's not outright sinfulness, just the consumption of their lives on everything other than God, it is such a misdirection. And so while we, of course, as I've shown you by my ministry on TikTok, but in, listen, we rush toward the darkness with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we do not surround ourselves and make our best friends, our counselors, or the people that we spend the majority of our time with and are mainly influenced by, those cannot be the ungodly. 
Or you'll find yourself in the position of Lot. And his soul was tormented. I did a little research there and I thought, where else in the Bible is that word torment used? Revelation 14, 9. Same Greek word as what happened to Lot because of the influence that he had in his life. Another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the people who take the mark of the beast and seal their fate will be tormented by God's wrath. The same Greek word is used of how Lot's soul was tormented by the influence of the ungodly people that he found himself living among. Okay? The ungodly, Psalm chapter 1. Go read Psalm chapter 1 tonight. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the sinners, who does not take the counsel of the ungodly. All right? It's not to happen. They should not be your main crowd of people. That word torment is also the word that is used in Revelation 20.10. When it says that the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet already were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I certainly don't think that Lot's choice of surrounding himself with the ungodly, spending most of his time with the ungodly, learning the ways of the ungodly, I certainly don't think that, that was a positive thing for Lot's life. How many of you would agree? So we need to think carefully about our choices. John Phillips, the last time we saw Lot, he was dwelling in the cities of the plain and pitching his tent toward Sodom. Now he dwelt in Sodom. One step leads to another. For a while, he kept the pretense of being a pilgrim. But soon, the attractions of the capital proved too great for him. And he made his home in the filthiest city on the face of the earth. Blessed, blessed words here. Uh, I believe it was Charles Stanley that recently has been preaching on Revelation as well. And I can't remember his exact words of his sermon, but I do remember something that I heard him say today. He said in the book of Revelation where the Bible says God will wipe every tear from our eyes, he personally believes that that is a reference to the fact that we as Christians will be taken up to heaven and we will face the judgment seat of Christ. Where we will be, our old sins will not be brought up before us at the judgment seat of Christ, because we're Christians, but we will be rewarded for our investment into the kingdom of God, right? He said, after that, after standing before holy God and answering for the moments, the talents, the money, the resources, and the affection of our lives. After standing before holy God and answering, he said, so many Christians will begin to weep, just weep at the sight and the knowledge of what they could have done for Jesus of the souls that could have been impacted by their lives, but instead they chose every other activity. I'm expounding it a little bit more, but he said he believes that those tears are the ones that will be dry before the new heaven and new earth. When God will come and wipe away those tears at the thought of the loss of what our lives could have counted for, for Jesus Christ. And so these are blessed words because John, what John Phillips is saying is, as a Christian, you shouldn't even pitch your tent towards a direction that you don't want your life to go. Where do you want your life to go? What do you want your life to be focused on? 
You have to make that spiritual mental decision because it is where you'll end up. I know this is some difficult preaching tonight, but the Holy Spirit must really want to bring this into play. And I know he has often, often corrected me in this. And I pray every day, Lord, lead me toward eternal things. Lead me toward the unseen realm. Don't let me be caught off guard because it's very, very easy to happen. John Phillips, Sodom, a treacherous quicksand for the soul, soon sucked Lot in. Nor could all of Abram's noble efforts free him from the fatal fascination of that vile place. For though Abram later did all a fellow believer could to rescue his brother, Lot went right back into the mire afterwards and had to be rescued by God again. And what John Phillips is trying to say is you may have some great Christian friends, but there is nobody who can make that decision for you. You can be under the influence of wonderful Christian teachers and pastors and friends and family members. But when it all comes down to it, when you stand before God for your life and what you did with your life and your decisions, there's nobody else going to be standing there with you. It is a decision that you alone have to make. Perhaps he was driven, this, this part's wild here. All you women out there just kind of plug your ears, right? We have to plug our ears. Perhaps he was driven there by the nagging of his wife. But John Phillips is saying, you know, people in our family can influence us in a wrong direction. That's absolutely true. Wives can do it. Husbands can do it. Parents can do it to their children. Children can do it to their parents. Uh, it's very important. We live in a society, uh, in the Christian world, sometimes I see that family is made to be God rather than God, God. But here's the deal. You can't even let your family members drive you to the wrong place. John Phillips, perhaps he was driven there by a nagging of his wife. Perhaps it was the worldly needs of his children that snared him. Oh, but my kid's got to go to that school. That's the only way my child's going to get a good education and a wonderful job. But my child has to be involved in 3,000 activities or they're never going to be the socialite that they need to be. They won't be successful. Oh, my kid has to have this many friends, even if the friends are very negative. Do you see how we can do that as Christians? I've watched that throughout my years in, in Christian schooling and in youth ministry. I've watched that happen. We pair, those of you who are parents cannot allow what you think are your child's needs to snag you. you got to get in the Word of God and find out what your child needs. And I'm going to tell you something. You can all testify to this. You know it's true. We have a generation of young people who don't know which way is up. They're on their phones 24-7. They're at every other kind of activity. Uh, things of the Lord are simply not made priority. And I'm talking about not made priority from Christian homes, not just regular homes. It's rough. But we've got to pitch our tent toward God or we will end up there, uh, away from God. Perhaps it was simply the desire to make more money. Oh, how many Christians do that? Well, I, I, I got I to, gotta, you know, make some sacrifices morally because I have to make more money. You know, I, I don't have time for everything God wants me to do. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to do this or that because my career, okay, that's a problem. Perhaps the poor fellow still thought he could be an influence for God. We're not told. All we know is the deluded man ended up going back. So sad. He went there in the first place. His friend Abram helped him. Then he went back and God had to rescue him. And uh, I'm thankful and grateful that I believe we will see Lot, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, we will see Lot in heaven. But I'm sure Lot is going to be one of many of us who stand before Jesus and have some tears to shed when we realize what our life could have been but was not because of decisions. Now verse 13. Now this is critical. I see we have enough time to go through this point. Uh, you may have wondered along with me for a long time in reading the Bible, I, I could not understand where did the word Hebrew come from? 
I mean, I know they are the Jewish nation. I know Abraham is the father of the Jews, but uh, why are they called Hebrews? Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. So someone escaped from the captivity and came and told Abram the Hebrew. I believe this is the first time in the Bible that we hear that word used, Hebrew. Henry Morris, verse 13 contains the first mention of the name Hebrew, and it applies it to Abram. Although its origin is uncertain, most scholars assume that it is derived from the name of Eber, which actually in the Hebrew has an H in front of it, which we would pronounce Heber, but in the Hebrew it's Eber, great grandson of Shem and distant ancestor of Abram. Okay? So... There's probably two reasons they're called Hebrews. This is definitely one of them from Eber, who is great grandson of Shem. Now, let me remind you of something. When you go back to Genesis 9:18, you see Noah and his sons getting off the ark. He had three sons. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. We did a detailed study of this to see how uh, peoples went across the earth after the flood. We also discussed these three sons. And if you will remember, Shem is the son through whom God brought Jesus Christ. It was through Shem's line. That was the blessed line. In Genesis 10, we read in verse 21 to 24, watch this. To Shem also the father of all the children of Eber. Which is interesting because this verse starts out mentioning Eber. Even though Eber is not his son, Eber is his great grandson. So in God's estimation, Eber was very important to the line of Shem. And then it goes on to say he was the elder brother of Japheth, the children were born, the sons of Shem. Elam, Asher, and it names them all. And then we get down to a park shod fathered Shelah and Shelah fathered Eber. So Eber is the great grandson of Shem, but he must be very important for the line of God's people because he is mentioned at the beginning. Many scholars believe that the word Hebrew comes from Eber or what we would see as H-E-B-E-R. It's derived from that word from that name. Henry Morris, the term Hebrew as applied here to Abram has also been translated by others as, and I looked this up too, uh, the man from beyond the river. It, it has a sense of from beyond or some type of dividing line. That is the Euphrates. The river that's constantly mentioned in the Bible is the Euphrates River. So, both of these would apply because we know the Hebrews or the Jewish people, and Jesus is a Jew, Jesus is a Hebrew, came through Shem. And for some reason, God points out Eber as a blessed great-grandson of Shem. So that would make sense that the word Hebrew comes from that. And it would also make sense if the word Hebrew has a connotation behind it as the man from beyond the river, that would make sense. And all of my Bible scholars now out there who've been in Genesis for a while, why would that make sense? Where does Abram come from? Does anybody remember the hometown of Abram? Gold star, if you can pin it up there, those of you who like to comment, anybody remember? It's a two-letter word. Abram came from Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram came from the Babylonian area, the Mesopotamian Valley. So either way, whether we derive the word Hebrew from Eber, great-grandson of the blessed line of Shem, through which Jesus came, or whether we define Hebrew as the man from beyond the river, hallelujah, that's Abram. Boy, getting a lot of hearts and likes on that. Are we getting hearts and likes because you're like me? And for so many years being a Christian, I had no idea why they were called Hebrews. I knew they were Jews. <laughs> when the Bible said Hebrew, I just didn't understand. Okay, good. Well, I guess that answered a, a question. 
Henry Morris, possibly both interpretations have a measure of truth in them. In any case, its first mention here is mainly to clearly distinguish Abram from the other inhabitants of Canaan. See that? Because these two, this man who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. In other words, you're not just a regular guy like the rest of the people living here. You're a Hebrew. Even though he entered into an economic and political pact with some of, some of them. John MacArthur. Foreigners use the term Hebrew of Israelites. And Israelites used it of themselves in the presence of foreigners. So Israelites were proud to call themselves Hebrews. And those are the chosen people of God. All right, I can see that my next verse is 13 here, and we're going to talk about this one who escaped, but I am going to leave it there because time is running short, and I don't want to get into the whole next segment. I am thankful for tonight's study. God gave me the strength and the energy I needed, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was really present. Amen? We are, the thing I like about this Bible study is we're not just learning knowledge that has to be in our head and in our hearts in order to interpret all of God's word, but the Holy Spirit also brings not only comfort, but he brings conviction. And that's what we need because we are on the road to righteousness, my friends, and we need the conviction of God's Holy Spirit. So thank you for hanging in with us tonight. Uh, I want to remind you before I pray, don't forget to join us Sundays at 10 for the Revelation series. And a reminder, I know some of you are going to boo this. We're going to get thumbs down. <laughs> I know you're going to put your so Here's the problem. You're only going to need one pair of socks for the rest of the month of June on Tuesdays. Okay? I'm sorry. But Shelly needs her rest. We only have... Genesis Bible study, the first, second, and third Tuesdays of the month. June happens to have five. So you're, I'm going to miss you for two solid Tuesdays. You're not going to lose any socks. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. And I think someday when we all, when we have a, a, an in-person gathering, if we can uh, arrange something, we should all seriously bring socks and at one point just throw them all up in the air. Wouldn't that be a cool celebration? But that's my way of reminding you, we will not have Genesis Bible study the next two Tuesdays, but we will the first Tuesday of July. So let's pray for each other in the meantime. Pray for me to gain strength, to have some time of rest, get ready to get right back into it with all of you, okay? Let me pray over you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this evening. Thank you so much for being so present with us. I thank you that we've learned things, that you have comforted us, that you have reassured us, but you've also convicted us. Lord, we constantly want to be rerouted by your Holy Spirit. We always want to be going your direction. Bless each and every person, Lord, in all of their endeavors toward you. Anoint them, empower them, and give them discernment. And I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. You know we love you very much, and I'll be praying for you. God bless.